And then we turned two pages, part of that same section, part of that same diagnosis, where it says feigned amnesia is more common in individuals with legal problems. The words feigned amnesia are not only in the book, they talk about the same diagnosis he gave to the defendant. Feigned amnesia, faking amnesia. It got worse. Do you remember what he said then? He said, they must have made a mistake. The American Psychiatric Association, in publishing the DSM-5, the fifth edition of this book, they made a mistake. Dr. Hassan doesn't make mistakes. The American Psychiatric Association makes mistakes. Then I asked him about all the things he left out of his report. All the things that he testified to that didn't show up in his report. For example, what about when the defendant first obtained that gun from Ruth Cox? It wasn't that he just obtained it that day, the day of the shooting. He had gotten it from her several days before. He asked her for it. She gave it to him and she never saw it again. It was unloaded. Surely that could have some bearing on the doctor's diagnosis. And he said, well, I did discuss that with him. It's not in his report. And then he said, I didn't think that was important. He said, I ruled out faking amnesia. I gave him a, a, a diagnosis of dissociative amnesia. I gave him a diagnosis of delusional disorder. But when he first obtained the gun that he used to shoot two people, that has no bearing whatsoever on my, on my report or my opinion. The last thing I'll mention about Dr. Hassan is about the tests. And again, it's your recollection that controls about whether or not the scoring system that he used to score these tests, whether that was valid or invalid. But the fact remains that whether he used a valid test scoring system or an invalid scoring system, he left the results out of his report. He ignored results from the tests he gave when they didn't fit his diagnosis. Results like possibility of defendant malingering or malingering is likely. Those were results of tests that he gave to the defendant, that he came in and testified about what a great test giver he is, how experienced he is. And yet when the results didn't fit with the diagnosis that he was hired to give, he didn't include them in his report. Judge Taylor is going to tell you as part of that insanity instruction that even the most terrible crimes are committed under the influence of an impulse. An impulse that overcomes the restraint that ordinarily prevents a person from committing a criminal act. What does that mean? It means that even the most terrible crimes are committed under an emotion without time to stop and think and just committed under the influence of that emotion, even though the person ordinarily wouldn't have committed the criminal act. Michael Barrison obviously had restraint on July 31st. He didn't shoot anybody. August 1st, he didn't shoot anybody. August 3rd, 5th, the other days he called the police, he didn't shoot anybody. But he shot two people, shot at another person on August 7th. And yet, Dr. Hassan gives a test to the defendant and ignores a result that says impulsiveness ignores a result that says chooses not to keep or control his emotions in check. He gave the defendant tests that showed that the defendant could have acted impulsively, could have acted under the influence of those emotions, and he didn't put any of it into his report. Why? I would suggest it's because he wanted to deceive you. He was hired by the defendant to give a certain opinion. Was Dr. Schlesinger is a hired gun? How is Dr. Hassan any different? Now, Dr. Simring is, is different. Dr. Simring is obviously testifying. You did hear him. He's testified on behalf of defense attorneys, on behalf of prosecutors. He testified uh, or was retained by my office many years ago at some point. But an expert's opinion is no better than the facts on which it's based. His opinion is no stronger than the facts that he has. 
Imagine a person needs to go to a doctor. It's not in the criminal context, but has to go to a doctor and researches the doctor and tries to find a doctor who's very qualified, has great credentials. Everybody raves about this doctor and how great they are. And so the person goes to see that doctor, goes in, sees the doctor, and the doctor says, no, 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 too much. Take too much time. I don't want to hear it. I don't need to hear it. Here's your diagnosis. That's basically what Dr. Simran did in this case. How many times did you hear him say to me, counselor, I'm not going to read all the discovery. Counselor, there's too much discovery to look at. He looked at the things that Michael Barrison gave him. He looked at the things that Michael Barrison told him were important. And then he came up with a diagnosis just based on that limited amount of information. His report makes that clear, and I, I, I hope that it was clear to all of you. I was not pointing out all the inaccuracies or all the errors to embarrass the doctor. That was not my intention. The reason I pointed those out was to point out all the places where he made incorrect assumptions, all the places where his report was inaccurate. Do you remember we talked about he doesn't listen to statements? Dr. Simring said, I'm not going to listen to all the statements. That would take me too much time. So what did he do? He relied on the police officer's reports where they summarized what they thought the statement said. And then we put it out, his summary of the police officer's summary was inaccurate. He was summarizing the summary differently than it was summarized. I know that's hard to follow, but the takeaway is that he was putting things into his summary that didn't come from the statement. He was putting things in his summary that came from things the defendant told him, things that weren't true. You heard the DCPMP caseworker. She testified that she was there not to investigate a sexual abuse claim. She was there to investigate a child abuse or a neglect claim. That's what she testified to. She wasn't even cross-examined. And yet then Dr. Simring takes the defendant saying they were there to investigate sexual abuse, and he puts that into his report, and he relies on that, even though it's wrong. It got worse. It got worse because he was talking about social media posts. <coughs> Mr. Belinkus did a big deal about these social media posts. Do you remember when Lauren Canerac was cross-examined about some of her social media posts? Mr. Belinkus pulled out a bunch of different social media posts and he said, didn't you post this? Look out world, here I come. And she said, yeah, that's from a musical. That's from The Greatest Showman. It's song lyrics. And then we went through the day she was posting that. She was listening to a Meat Loaf's song. And then she was posting about some other type of song after that. And yet these are the, these are the posts that are supposedly driving Michael Barrison to this delusion of fear. Mr. Belinkus cross-examines her on this post about the guns. This horrible, frightening, terrifying post where Lauren Canerac says, yes, I do own guns. <clears throat> do you remember what he left out? Do you remember on cross-examination when Lauren Canerac read the rest of this post where it said, they're both in North Carolina? That part was left out on direct ex uh, cross-examination. We had to clean that up after Mr. Belinkus questioned her because he left that part of the post out. And then this is the same post that's apparently given by the defendant to Dr. Simring where he says, look, look doc, she's posting about guns. I was frightened. I was in a kill or be killed situation. Then I asked the doctor, well doctor, he gave you that post, he said he relied on that post. He was terrified of Warren Canada because she posted that she had guns. Did you listen to the 911 calls? Yes. Did you listen to the 911 call on July 31st where the defendant is asked, have any guns or weapons been mentioned or threatened? His answer on the call, no. The doctor said he was aware of that. On August 1st, the defendant calls 911. Are any weapons mentioned or threatened? 
No, the doctor was aware of that call. On August 3rd, the defendant calls 911. Are any weapons mentioned or threatened? Not that I've heard a word of. The doctor was aware of that. And then on August 5th, the defendant calls 911. Were any weapons threatened or mentioned? His answer, not so far. The doctor said that he knew about all of those calls. The week leading up when this delusion has supposedly crippled the defendant into the fetal position where he believes on August 7th, the only thing he can do is take a gun and try to kill Orrin Canarac because of this delusion. And yet when he's calling 911, he's not saying a word about any of these threatening posts about firearms. And then he tells the doctor, this is what drove my delusion of fear. But perhaps the most troubling thing that came up when Dr. Simmering testified was when he was shown a series of what were called posts, social media posts. And he said, yes, these are posts that Michael Barrison gave me. He said he saw these posts, he said he relied on them, and I relied on them. Do you remember on cross-examination, I asked him if he was aware that one of those posts wasn't a post at all. It was actually a private message that came from Facebook that my office turned over to the defendant in discovery. And then the defendant is giving that private message that there is no evidence he could have ever seen before the shooting. He's giving that to the doctor and saying, look what she's posting, look what this says. And then the doctor bases his opinion on that. If you believe that the doctor relied on inaccurate or false or incomplete information, you can discount his entire opinion. And I would suggest that here, neither of the doctors that the defense called are credible. For different reasons, but that their diagnosis of delusional disorder should be rejected. Now, Mr. Belinkus talked about Dr. Schlesinger and said, Dr. Schlesinger's a hired gun. He says whatever we want him to say. He said he didn't even come in and testify why he disagrees about the delusional disorder. My recollection is that he testified to what a delusion is. A delusion is a fixed false belief that's not based in reality. And he said in his opinion, in his review of discovery, in his, all the time he spent with the defendant, there's no evidence that the defendant was disconnected from reality. Everything that he said was connected to reality. Dr. Simring testified a delusion is idiosyncratic. And I said, doctor, what does idiosyncratic mean? It means it's unique to this person. No one else thinks the same thing. And then Dr. Schlesinger said, well, didn't everybody have concerns and fears and find these posts that Lauren was making threatening in some way or another? You heard that testimony. That's not made up. And yet the defendant is the only one that had a delusion, or did everybody have the delusion? It doesn't make sense. The last thing that I'll say about Dr. Schlesinger is that he testified about that issue of malingered amnesia. And if you remember, he basically said malingered amnesia means that the person is faking. And both he and Dr. Simran testified. There is no memory disorder that's selective for criminal behavior. What does that mean? It means there's no memory disorder, whether in the DSM or anywhere, that a person would forget just the time when they're committing a criminal act until they're finished committing a criminal act. There's no memory disorder for that. And yet that's exactly what you have in this case. The defendant has an excellent memory of everything that Lauren Canerac did to him, of everything that he was feeling and experiencing in that week leading up to the shooting, even up to that morning when the caseworker shows up. And then he stops remembering the moment he puts his hand on a deadly weapon. He stops remembering the moment he loads that deadly weapon and goes to confront her. He stops remembering the part where he shoots her twice in the chest and tries to shoot Rob. 
and then he doesn't start remembering again until he's at the hospital. And the first thing that he says at the hospital, when he opens up his eyes and he's in the hospital bed and his arm is all bandaged up because it's been broken and he's all beat up, he doesn't say, where am I? What am I doing here? How did I get here? He says, they destroyed my life. I had a good life. All right, we have to hit the pause button and squeeze in a break because we're nearing the bottom of the hour. We're going to take you back into the courtroom right where we left off. Thank you for watching Court TV Live. Rex. We have some breaking news we want to share to you. This coming from Idaho, in particular, Fremont County, Idaho, where we have learned that the court is recognizing that Lori Vallow Debau has been restored to competency. Remember, we told you how she was deemed incompetent, meaning unfit to stand trial. Well, now her competency has been restored. This means her case can proceed to trial. So we have an order uh, the court just issued on this, uh, saying in part, quote, based Based upon the court's determination that defendant Lori Vallow Daybell is restored to competency and is fit to proceed, the court orders that the defendant be brought before this court to be arraigned. So what's going to happen is she's going to be transferred from the uh, custody, if you will, of the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. That's where she's been since she's been deemed incompetent to now the Fremont County Sheriff's Department. So she will go back to the local jail there in Fremont County, Idaho, and then be brought in front of the trial judge for arraignment on April the 19th, 1 p.m., Eastern time is when we understand this is going to happen. And of course, we're going to be following that arraignment. We will be there for all of it as we've been trial, you know, trial tracking this case since the inception, really before uh, she was even charged, since her children went missing. Uh, we know that is what she's accused of. She's accused of, of the deaths of her kids, JJ, JJ Vallow and Tylee Ryan, uh, her two children that went missing while she was off in Hawaii with her husband, Chad Daybell. Uh, his wife, Tammy Daybell, is also someone she's accused of helping to kill. We know she is, is charged as a co-conspirator with her husband, Chad Daybell, uh, who was a religious leader. Uh, she's been given that nickname Cult Mom uh, because she became a follower of his teachings. And then the two became romantically involved in all of the deaths. Very, very, very suspicious. Uh, this is quite an ugly case. Uh, it's set to go in January. And we know Chad's case has been proceeding all this time while hers has been kind of lingering in the court system. Well, now there will be time for it to catch up. Uh, in these cases are joined. Remember, he was trying to have his case severed from hers. They're going to be joined. So we know January of 2023 is when they are supposed to go. Uh, but this is huge news today as her competency has been restored. I want to bring in now for a little bit of discussion criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Daryl Cohen. He's standing by in Atlanta. Uh, Daryl, I know we have to go back to the New Jersey case. And I thought a perfect segue to go back to that one would be to ask you to kind of help us understand a couple things here. Here in the Vallo case, we've got the competency issue, right? The inquiry as to how she is here and now ready to stand trial. But in the Barrison case in New Jersey, the jury has to do a backward looking inquiry, right? To his mental state at the time of the incident, whether he was insane or not at the time the crime occurred. Would you talk to us about the differences there, please? Well, Julie, let's go to the Vallo case or cult mom. This is, does she understand right from wrong? And if that's the case and the courts have deemed that she does, then she can go to trial and be found guilty or not guilty or heaven forbid, a mistrial. Co going now back to New Jersey, the court is trying to determine or the jury is trying to determine did he understand when he committed this crime of trying to kill? Did he understand right from wrong at the time? And the prosecutor has done a very meticulous, though rather boring job of bringing that to the jury. So the jury has to decide, did our defendant, did the defendant, did he know right from wrong at the time he tried to kill these people? If he did, then he can be found guilty or not guilty. If not, then there's always not guilty by reason of insanity. There's a guilty but insane. And so that's kind of where it is.
Yeah, uh, so this is a, quite a, a big day, of course, as we know it, in the New Jersey case where the prosecutor has to sort of tie it all together, all of the evidence that was presented, and refute what defense counsel is saying. Because we know, and Daryl, you know this well, practicing criminal defense work, that they've got this burden of production, but the burden of proof never, ever shifts to the defense. So what we're going to do now is go back in to the courtroom in New Jersey, exactly where we left off. Let's see what the prosecution is arguing. I had a good life and they took it all away. That statement wasn't made in a vacuum. That statement was made after he supposedly doesn't remember shooting these two people. The DSM, feigned or uh, malingered amnesia, says people will often spontaneously confess when they're faking. Was that a spontaneous confession? He didn't have time to necessarily come up with a plan. Mr. Boinka said it'd be way better for me. It would be so much better for me if he made up that this was in self-defense. But he didn't do that because that's not what happened. Did the defendant know and appreciate the nature and quality of his acts? That's the other part of the insanity defense. So if you believe that the defendant has convinced you that he was delusional, that's not the end of the inquiry. You still have to decide whether that delusional disorder made it such that he didn't know the nature and quality of his acts or that he didn't know what he was doing was wrong. And the judge is going to tell you, you do not have to rely just on the doctors for this. You can rely on your common sense. You can rely on the other evidence that you heard. What did the other evidence show? All the same things that established that the defendant wanted to kill show that he knew the nature and quality of his actions. Everything had fallen apart. The working relationship, the business relationship, the social relationship, the farm is getting shut down, police are there, town officials are coming, lawyers are sending fake eviction notices. Everything has fallen apart. Then I ask, from a common sense perspective. What's the trigger? What makes it on August 7th, 2019, defendant hasn't seen Warren or Rob at all that day? What makes the delusion at that point click? Turns off his memory and makes him say, I have to go kill or be killed. This delusion of fear has now driven me to have to go and kill. It's the Dyfus Cape, uh, the DCPMP caseworker showing up there. Not to say, Warren and Rob called us and said something about you. The defendant isn't sitting in his office, doesn't look out the window and see a bird flying overhead and believe that the bird was sent to spy on him by Warren and Rob and that he has to go kill them. He sees the caseworker there and he decides in that moment to act impulsively, to act emotionally and to act purposely and to go try and kill Lauren and Rob. So I would suggest the evidence shows that the defendant did not carry his burden with respect to the insanity defense. So to wrap up, the evidence in this case brings us back to where I started my opening two weeks ago a sprawling, picturesque, 50-acre equestrian farm in Long Valley, New Jersey. A place where Lauren Kanarek, who's an aspiring rider, had gone to train. And she didn't just pick this place for no reason. She picked it because of the defendant. She wanted to go there to learn and train and become a better rider. And if you remember the testimony about this picture, she said she did become a better rider. She said this picture was taken after she had just achieved, I think it was her bronze level or something of that nature. It was a big achievement for her. It was a big step along the way. Did these look like people who always hated each other, were always scared of each other? They looked pretty genuinely happy in that picture probably because she had just... We need to squeeze in a break. Don't go anywhere. Much more Court TV Live for you right after this. Call now.
right, welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. Let's go back to New Jersey together now. We're seeing the state wrapping up its final arguments before the jury gets the case against Olympic equestrian Michael Barrison. Push something. And the defendant had helped her like he had helped all those other people along the way. Now on the afternoon of August 7th, 2019, at that farm, a DCP and P caseworker pulls onto the driveway. She pulls up the driveway, she goes past the farmhouse on the left, she goes up over the rise and pulls down into the parking lot. She parks the car in the parking lot in front of that stable and the, the big clubhouse, all the training arenas nearby, and she gets out and she sees a man. That man turns out to be the defendant, Michael Barrison. A great horseman, a very well-respected, highly regarded trainer. A coach and trainer who knows that respect and trust are the keys to success. Who doesn't have any respect or trust anymore for his student, feels like she doesn't have any respect or trust for him anymore. He's frustrated. Furious, you could say. Not frenzied, not frantic, not freaking out, but furious. Maybe seething is a better word. Frustrated, perhaps desperate, emotional. Emotions are not delusions. And he's feeling very emotional at that point in time. When the DCPNP caseworker identifies herself as being from DCPNP, he's at his breaking point. He's not delusional, he's not freaking out. He's reached his breaking point because two days before, his mentor, George Morris, another great horseman, had just been given a lifetime ban from equestrian competition. And in that moment, in the parking lot at his farm, he envisions the same fate for himself. He imagines Dr. Lauren Kenrack must have done this. She must have called. She must have reported him for sexual abuse. It's not what happened. That's what he imagines in the light of everything that's going on. And for doing that, she has to die. The caseworker goes inside, and she meets with uh, Mary Haskins, the mother of the children. And the defendant interrupts once, interrupts twice, on the third time, he interrupts and says, I need the office now. You have to go somewhere else. And on her way out the office, he stops her and he gives her a goodbye kiss. He says goodbye because he knows and appreciates exactly what he's about to do. He goes into the safe. He opens up the safe and he takes out Ruth Cox's gun. And he loads the bullets in the gun and he makes sure to take an extra magazine of bullets in his pocket with him. He purposely picks that deadly weapon at that moment because he knows and appreciates exactly what he's about to do. He goes outside, he gets into his truck, and he starts to drive. Starts to go confront Lauren and Rob. And in him going to confront his enemy, he knows and appreciates exactly what he's about to do. He parks the truck, he gets out. He intentionally stands behind a bush where no one can see his waistband, no one can see his pocket, no one can see his hands. And he says to Rob Goodwin, how can we end this without a war? He knows that he's armed with a deadly weapon. He knows there will be no war because he's about to commit a murder. But he waits. He waits until his enemy, Lauren Kenrack, has stepped down off that step until she's no closer than Mr. Belinkus is to me right now. And then he hits his breaking point and reaches in and pulls out the gun and shoots her twice. And as Rob Goodwin tries to flee from him, he tries to shoot at Rob, but the gun is out of bullets. None of what I just said was driven by any sort of an emotion, uh, delusion of fear. Everything I just said was driven by the defendant's emotional impulses. So in closing, I would ask 
that you not return a verdict based on any sympathy, disgust, or emotion, but that you return a verdict that's based on reason, based on facts, and based on the law. And I would suggest if you do that, you will return a just verdict of guilty. Thank you.